Hello, and welcome to class four of Crave the Wave. My name is Russ Burleson, and as you can see from the screen here, there is my email. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. Today, we're going to be talking about Doppler effect, spectroscopy, and the energy of a photon. These are all electromagnetic topics. Please keep in mind that Doppler effect uh, calculations are only at the state and national level, but the theory is covered at the regional level as well. So let's talk about the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect is what's sometimes referred to as a Doppler shift, and it is the change in frequency of a wave in relation to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. Okay, so in this particular example, you see this gift down below here. We have a person in, a, in their car and they're honking their horn. Now you'll notice when they're honking their horn, when they've stopped, the, waves, the wave is at constant frequency. But then as they drive forward from right to left, you'll notice that in front of the vehicle, the waves are compressed. So they're uh, smaller wavelength, higher frequency. You'll also notice that behind the vehicle as it's driving, as there's a velocity, it, the waves are expanded. So the frequency is, is lower, but the wavelength is higher. Because remember, wavelength and frequency are always inversely related. Now this works for both sound and electromagnetic, so and in light as well, waves. And what you'll find out is that wavelength decreases or the frequency increases when the source and receiver are going towards each other. Whether it's one moving towards the other, it doesn't matter. It does matter from how you calculate it, but in both cases, the wavelength is going to decrease and the frequency is going to go up. Okay. Now, you can have it where one's moving and the other one's stationary. That's quite common. You can also have it where they're both moving towards each other. And then uh, the, uh, the increase in frequency is magnified. Now, wavelength will increase and frequency will decrease if they're moving apart from each other. Okay? So what that means is, is that if I was standing stationary behind this vehicle, I'm, and it's driving away from me, but honking its horn. I'm going to hear the horn, but the horn's going to be at a lower frequency. Okay. Also, if I was running away from the vehicle, I'd probably have to run pretty fast to be able to tell the difference. But if I was able to run really fast away from the vehicle, I could probably tell a, that I, it's going away. And that's why when you hear a train horn, okay, if the train's not moving, it's got a particular sound. If it's coming towards you, it's going to have a higher pitch sound, and you can tell that. Okay. And if it's going away from you, it's got a lower pitch sound, and you can tell that. Or if you ever have a car go by you, especially a car go by you at a very fast uh, speed, like let's say you're riding your bike on the shoulder and the cars are whizzing by you, you can tell the difference in the sound of the car approaching you and the sound of the car going away from you. So, the, the full Doppler um, uh, formula is that the observed frequency, in other words, what the observer or the receiver sees, is equal to the source frequency times C plus or minus V sub R divided by C plus or minus V sub S. Now, the reason why it says plus or minus is C is the speed of the wave in that particular medium. So it, it, if it's a speed of sound, we have to do all our speed of sound calculations. If it's speed of light, you have to do all your speed of light calculations, okay? And so generally, those are the two most common ones. Uh, you can have other ones, but the two most common ones are gonna be sound and light for these types of problems. And when I say light, that includes all electromagnetic spectrum. So sometimes it's, visible light, sometimes it's radar, sometimes it's radio waves, etc. Or or it if or it could be a uh you know 
uh, all sorts of different types of Doppler effect systems are out there. So, so V sub R is the speed of the receiver. So what you'll notice is this will be added when it's moving towards the source and it's subtracted when it's moving away from the source. And so the thing I always tell my students is that when you're looking at this, the speed of the receiver, do you think it's going to increase the frequency or decrease the frequency? If it's going to increase the frequency, then you add it. If it's going to decrease it, you subtract it. Now, let's look at V sub S. That's the, the speed of the source relative. Like in this particular case, if I was standing in front of the vehicle as it's honking its horn, okay, to me, it makes sense that as it's approaching me, even though I'm stationary, I'm going to hear a higher frequency, okay? But since it is below, you know, it's, 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 it's below the dividing line or, or it's a denominator, I'm going to add when I'm moving away from the source, okay? And I'm going to subtract when moving towards the source, okay? So it's always going to be a little bit different, if you will, than for the receiver. But the key thing that I always find that helps me make sure I'm adding and subtracting what I'm supposed to is asking myself the question, is the relative speed supposed to increase or decrease the frequency? And if it's going to increase the frequency, it means I need to make the top bigger and or the bottom smaller. And if it's going to decrease it, I need to make the top smaller for the bottom bigger. So, but what happens if you go faster than the speed of sound? Like airplanes, um, uh, projectiles like bullets uh, often go faster than the speed of sound. Uh, and even uh, things like the cracking of a bullwhip is the tip of the bullwhip actually for an instant going faster than the speed of sound. It's actually not hitting anything. That's why you, when you crack a bullwhip up in the air, it makes this really loud pop. And that pop is a small sonic boom. And a sonic boom is, is the sound that is associated with exceeding the speed of sound, okay? So you might remember we talked about the speed of sound being 343 meters per second at sea level at 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So if I go 344 meters per second at sea level, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to go faster than the sound I'm creating. And so what you'll notice here in the upper left-hand corner here is that all those sound waves Remember how we were talking about the Doppler effect? It gets compressed so much that the sound, I'm, I, I'm actually writing my own sound wave. Okay. You'll also notice that you still have the Doppler effect behind you. Okay. Because you're going away from stuff at a really, really fast speed. Okay. Now, and what will happen is, is that it actually creates shock waves that travel through the media. And these shock waves are, can be felt. You know, you can just feel them hitting you. Um, you can also hear them because they're like an explosion. So it's just like a shock wave from an explosion. That's why they call it a sonic boom. And it's when you break the sound barrier, when you go faster than the speed of sound. Now, the Mach number is how much faster than the speed of sound you're going. So if I'm going Mach 1, I'm going exactly at the speed of sound. If I'm going Mach 2, I'm going twice the speed of sound. If I'm going Mach 1.5, then that is 1.5 times the speed of sound. Now, it will be different at different altitudes, as we discovered, at different temperatures and different materials. But the Mach number is always the ratio of how fast you're going to the speed of sound, okay? Now, so that shock wave, if I start going faster than the speed of sound, like in the, uh, like in the upper right-hand corner here, I'm going faster than the speed of sound, 
you'll notice it actually starts forming a cone behind me of that shock wave. Okay. And so what that is called is a shock wave cone. Okay. And the angle from the direction I'm going down to the, the angle of the cone, if you will, given by alpha is the inverse sine or the arc sine of one over the Mach number. Okay. Or if you know the velocity of the object and you know the speed of sound of the object, you can also do the arc sine of the speed of sound divided by the velocity of the object. Okay. Now, the, the key thing in mind is that this is, this is a way that you can figure out how fast an object is, is, is going uh, if you're able to see the, uh, you know, the, the uh, shockwave cone, and then you can figure out from that angle. Now, like I said, one up, you know, it doesn't have to be a bullet. It doesn't have to be a plane. The bigger the object, usually the louder the noise. So if you have like a supersonic bomber flying overhead or a supersonic plane flying overhead at Mach 1.5, that's going to be really doggone loud. Okay. Uh, they've had cases where it's blown out windows. It's blown out people's eardrums. It's made people get violently ill just because of the hit of the shock wave. It's knocked them down. Okay, um, so it's so that's one reason why they usually don't like uh, airplanes going supersonic unless they're way out to sea. Okay, but if it's something small, uh, it can still be loud, but it's going to be more like a pop. So like the tip of a bullwhip when you flip it, and the, that little tip just goes real fast for a very short period of time and it creates a small sonic boom that's just going to be loud uh but you also uh hear about it with uh soup and and if you're faster in the speed of sound they refer to that as supersonic if you're slower in the speed of sound they call that subsonic so what happens if i do it with light or electromagnetics and now the Doppler effect, same equations apply. So in other words, if something's coming towards me, the frequency is going to go up, wavelength's going to go down. Something's going away from me, the frequency is going to go down, and the wavelength's going to go up. Okay? So if something's going away from me and it's producing light, that's called redshift. And that's because all the things that I look at normally are shifted to the red side of the spectrum, the lower side of the spectrum. And so let's say I was looking at spectroscopy results, like on the left-hand side here, but I noticed that they all seem to be moved over by a, certain, by a certain amount of frequency. I can tell using the Doppler effect how far, how fast that object is going away from me if it's got redshift. Now let's say the object's coming towards me. It's gonna have the opposite effect. Frequency is gonna go up. So I'm gonna have a blue shift, okay? So you have blue shift when objects are coming towards you and red shift when objects are going away from you. Now, just like I said before, everything's relative to the speed of the wave. So the speeds of these waves are almost always gonna be the speed of light, or they, they are gonna be the speed of light. And the medium is usually outer space because that's usually the only place we've got enough running room. Although you can have some stuff in air and in the sea uh, for like radar and microwaves and such. But what you'll notice is, is that, so things generally have to be going faster so that it's more relative, if you will, to see a big change in the, in the frequencies. Okay. Now, where else do we use it? in the electromagnetic spectrum. We also use it with police radar when they hold it out and they can tell the difference in speed, if you will, that you're driving, okay? Either towards them or away from them. We also use it quite a bit in weather and that's how they're able to say, hey, look, there's a tornado somewhere it's because they see a bunch of wind going in a circular pattern and they go, oh my gosh. Well, the way they're able to determine the, uh, 
The speed of that is through is through the Doppler effect. Okay, that's also how they're able to determine. Oh, this storm front's moving at ten miles an hour, or what have you. Okay, and then of course where where I used to work at in the Air Force, we were very concerned about aviation radar because we wanted to be able to spot a plane. We wanted to be able to tell the direction and the speed of the plane, and we would use Doppler quite a bit for that. So let's talk about what is spectroscopy. So that is a general field of study that measures and inter interprets the spectra of some matter, okay, as a function of the wavelength or frequency, okay? And what you're doing there is, is that you are usually using it to analyze data that you receive. In other words, if I uh, have the full light spectrum of let's say hydrogen, okay? I can then determine if like a gas sample has hydrogen in it. Uh, I can do the same thing with oxygen and they literally have millions of the spectra for various types of atoms and molecules identified, okay? So it's quite useful and you'll hear about the chromatography and, and stuff like that. These are all things that they do to try to figure out, okay, well, uh, it, how much oxygen's in it? How much argon's in it, et cetera, et cetera. So, so let's talk about the, you know, and the precise study of color is generalized from visible light to all things in the electromagnetic spectrum. So even though we generally show it in the visible spectrum, that's just to help us with, with, uh, with our perception because we're really good at, at looking at color, but you can actually do spectroscopy. You can do X-ray spectroscopy. You can do gamma ray spectroscopy and you'll see um, uh, infrared spectroscopy is really popular right now with the James Webb telescope. And so generally speaking, what you'll have is you'll have a light source, you'll have some sort of collimator, in other words, to get it nice and straight and coherent, and then you'll put it through a prism or through a diffraction grate. And the purpose for that is we want to spread out the light, okay, or spread out the, um, the electromagnetic waves based on frequency, okay? Because remember, we were talking about how a prism you know, spreads out the light because the indexes of refraction are slightly different for each color of light. So you spread out that light and then you have some sort of, of, a, of a solution, if you will, okay? Or, or some other type of material and then you have a detector, okay? And some of the light is gonna be, is gonna pass right through it. Some of the light, is going to be absorbed and that particular pattern we can then use now if we look at absorption line spectrum that is how much made it through that particular um sample so like if i if i was to uh you know put a cloud of, of some type of gas heat it up and then have that light go through a prism, the things that were absorbed, excuse me, so I've, I've got the light source here. It goes through a cloud of gas. And it's usually excited gas in a particular way. I can then look at the lines that were absorbed and that'll be indicative of the type of material that was in that gas. Now, I can also just heat up that gas and see what's emitted from that and I get an emission line spectrum. And both of these will tell me what type of gas that was. Now, if I was to just do it with no, with no sample, I get the continuous spectrum. In a, the two major types, of course, are absorption and emission spectroscopy. But you also have elastic scattering, uh, you've got impedance spectroscopy, you've got inelastic scattering, you've got coherent flash resonance spectroscopy, and you've got nuclear spectroscopy. So these are all different ways of doing um, 
analysis of various types of samples. But the two main types that you're going to see on almost all your tests are going to be impedance and emission. So let's talk about absorption spectroscopy. Okay, so we're going to measure the absorption of radiation as a function of frequency. So, so what you'll notice here is that starlight gets down to through the planet's sodium-rich atmosphere. Okay, so we've got a we've got a detector on the Earth. Then I put it through a spectrograph, and then it will tell me which lines were fully absorbed. And if I look at those two lines there that will tell me what type of material that was, okay? And so when you think of absorption, you're going to have the full spectrum behind it, and then you're going to have black marks wherever it was absorbed, okay? And you'll have it usually, uh, it'll look something like this that will go from violet all the way to red, okay? Uh, in, in some cases, may even go beyond, might go in the infrared, might go in the ultraviolet. And you could have a lot of different materials in there and they're all overlapping with each other, okay? And so the good news is, is that if I've got hydrogen and let's say argon in there, um, they both absorb. So they're both gonna be present. So both of their line sets will be there and I can say, oh, that's hydrogen and argon, okay? And that's how they're able to say, oh, well, this planet is made up of so much nitrogen and so much carbon, et cetera, et cetera. Emission spectroscopy, okay, is usually done where you have a small type of material that you then heat up somehow, get it in gaseous form, and then you put a light through it, okay? And then you'll have some sort of, like you notice, a prism or a grating, spread out the light, the, uh, the monochromator, okay? And then it will then give you the emission spectrum, okay? And so these, again, are the resonant areas of that material. So if I look here, here's the emission spectrum of hydrogen, okay? And here's the emission spectrum below of iron. So you'll notice the more complex the material, the more different resonances it's going to have. Iron's got a lot more different shells in its uh, in its valence and other bands, whereas hydrogen's only got one band. Okay, so it's only going to have one set of uh, of of uh, of uh, emission areas. The other thing is, is that you'll notice it's mainly black now with colored lines. And so that's usually the, the best way you can tell. The other thing is, is that you'll notice here that this had a whole bunch of lines and that's because this one is the, that I think this particular one is the emissions uh, absorption spectrum of the sun. So all the materials that are in the sun are included in here and they're all overlapping with each other. So if you, again, if you think about it, and by the way, this is from James Webb here, you have a light that's got a continuous spectrum. It goes through uh, some gas and then we look, we can either see what's emitted or what's absorbed by that light, okay? So if the light's directly behind it, that's usually a good way to do absorption. And if you're looking off from the side, if you will, where you're not getting the direct light, now that's how you're gonna do your emissions. The other thing I want you to notice is that absorption occurs when the photon or the electromagnetic energy impacts the atom and takes the electrons and it bumps them up to a higher state but it absorbs, it absorbs that energy. So you'll notice the more bands you have, the more room you have for things moving back and forth. And that's the reason why iron was so much more complex than hydrogen, okay? Emission is where you have an atom in an excited state and the 
and, or excuse me, an electron, and the electron in the atom goes to its normal state. So it's dropping. And so it emits uh, photons in of that frequency. And you'll notice here, like for sodium, here is the absorption and emission spectra for sodium. Here it is for hydrogen or for nitrogen. Here it is for hydrogen. Okay, here it is for oxygen. Okay, so you'll notice as long as we keep it to uh, things with lower atomic numbers that are more gaseous, it tends to be a little bit um, uh, less complex. So an example of an emission spectrum, okay, is that they are able to figure out, looking at the various wavelengths of light, okay, how much iron, how much argon, how much neon, how much sulfur, you know, and you'll notice neon had one, two, three, four, five lines in here. Sulfur's got two lines in here. So sometimes when you're looking over a particular uh, frequency range, uh, one's going to have one line, one's going to have five lines. And then you can also see, oh, wait, here's molecular hy hydrogen, and it's got three different resonant points. And then in here, this is where you have your silicates. So this is how they're able to figure out the composition of gas. And again, it's not like there's a light behind that. What we're actually doing in this particular case is we're seeing what's emitted from them from uh, from whatever other type of energy they're getting. And in this particular case, it's around an active black hole. So they're, they're taking the energy of the black hole, which is doing things to the materials around it, which causing them to emit. One thing to keep in mind, there is no perfect light source or no perfect electromagnetic source. So you'll notice like for daylight, this is what, if you were to just measure the sun, you'll notice that most of the light is gonna be in the yellow um, uh, area. Funny, that's why it's a yellow sun. <laughs> you'll also notice that, you know, there's a little less red and a lot less blue and violet, okay? So when we are looking at sunlight, let's say we're using sunlight and doing absorption with sunlight, we, it really does help to know what's the base because then you can really calculate if you have emissions that are higher. Are you following what I'm saying? And then over here, you'll notice uh, below this, we have an incandescent lamp, which is like a normal lamp. Uh, you know, it's just like the, the old style. And then if you have a fluorescent lamp, you'll notice it actually looks a lot more like daylight. Okay. So it's very important to know what type of source you're using because you have to take that into account when making your measurements. And we talked about the energy of a photon. Now, the energy of a photon is determined by the frequency. And this is, uh, this is a pretty simple thing, but it does involve scientific notation. The energy of a, of a single photon is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. Now, Planck's constant is, you see here, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per hertz or 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volts per hertz. So electron volts is a type of energy measurement that's based on a single electron, okay? And it's usually to make the math work out a little bit easier when you're talking about the really, really small amounts of energy. OK, so when you're talking about uh, energy from individual atoms and things like that, you'll often hear about electron volts. OK, and one electron volt is like 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So they're both measures of energy. Now, you can also use electron volts to measure mass of particles and et cetera, but we're only going to be talking about it using uh, measuring energy here. Now. So what you will notice is that we, we have F here. You'll occasionally see new used, but that's the frequency, okay? But since we also know frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength, I can calculate the energy whether I have the frequency or the wavelength. 
H remains the same no matter what. And again, when we look over here, we're talking about the absorption and we're talking about the transmission. So whether the, so whether the, um, the, um, the, uh, it's being absorbed or transmitted, the energy of that absorption or that, or that transmission or that emission is going to be defined by E equals a, uh, Planck's constant times frequency. And so if I look here, if I come down from one hertz all the way to 10 to the 25, which is really high, so we're in the gamma, ra gamma rays for sure, and the wavelength, if you'll notice here, was, you know, gosh, like the size of the solar system, <laughs> all the way to much, much smaller than the size of an electron, the photon energy goes from very, very small to very, very high. So as frequency goes up, energy goes higher. So if I was to say which has more energy, radio waves or gamma rays, you're going to say, oh, definitely gamma. Gamma's got the most. And usually they're the ones that can cause the most damage, especially to organic things like humans. So like if you ever hear about UV rays, injuring your eyes, that's why. Our eyes are designed for visible light. You start getting the UV range, our eyes are not de designed for that. X-rays, our eyes are not designed for that. Gamma rays, our eyes are not designed for that. And all of those things can damage our eyes and do things like cause cancer and, and other things, because again, we can't handle that level of energy. And so that is, um, class four, and I hope you enjoyed it.